good morning. <laughs> that was pathetic. We're going to try that again. Good morning. There we go. Everybody alive? Well, if you're not, you know the, the op option of uh, not being alive. It's not good. You're alive in Christ this morning? I'm dealing with a little bit of a throat thing, so if I can be up here and talk, let's all stand. We're going to get these, these lungs opened up. Come on. Are you ready to worship him today? I feel like everybody needs a little jolt, some caffeine. Let's go. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're our defense today. cannot see you are my strength though my heart is weak you won't let go you take my place on this battlefield you go before you're my sword and shield I'm not Hallelujah. 
What better protector than the God Almighty, amen, to go to battle for you and for me. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You move any mountain, Father God, that you go, you'll go and move it for us, Jesus, big or small. Thank you, Father. God.
your presence, Lord, everything is made new. We love you today, Jesus. We're in your presence, Father. You said where two or three are gathered in your name, you would be in the midst. And I believe you're here today, Jesus. Move in this place, God, like only you can do. Let us get out of the way so that you can get in our way.
from scripture that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. We read Psalm 139 where you can't go anywhere where God's not there. But when we talk about the presence of God, we're talking about his manifest presence. That when we worship him, that when we engage him, whether it's through prayer, the singing of songs, when we lift up our hearts to glorify him, not only for all that he does, but for who he is. That his presence manifests itself. And that is what we can sense with our senses. We can feel it in our hearts and our spirit. And today, in this, we're in his presence. Where two or three have gathered in his name, he's guaranteed he's here. But that his presence is among us. Now, when we feel his presence, we have two choices. To worship or deny that that presence is even there. To worship him because he is God. And when we worship him, it doesn't matter if you sense what Isaiah sensed when he got in the presence of God where he said, woe is me. Because when you get in the presence of a holy God, you're going to sense your own sinfulness. You're going to sense your own lack in his presence. But the thing about it is we know because Jesus Christ, when we come into his presence and we're sensed of that awareness that we have grace, that we can go into the throne room boldly and that we can ask whatever we will. The second song we said that we can ask that the mountains be moved. And there may be mountains in your life today. There be mountains of health, mountains of finance, mountains of of family issues, any kind of thing that we want. And in his presence, we can ask whatever we want according to his will, trusting that he's going to do it in his way and his time. And that includes when we pray for our one. And this is a perfect time that we stand in the manifest presence of God, that we think about those in our life who need Jesus Christ, wherever they may now be, whatever they may now be doing, that we call their name before the God who sits on the throne, before the throne room in which we have entered with our worship, past the torn veil of the temple that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, it was torn from the top to the bottom, that we can enter in with freedom, We can enter in with mercy, and we can enter in and ask boldly, God, save this person. Somehow, some way, save my husband, save my wife, save my children, save my neighbor, save my colleague, save my friend. So as we ask and glorify God and ask him to bless our service with his continued presence, let's ask on behalf of those that we love, those that we desire to see come into his presence and to also worship him as king. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your glory and for your honor. We thank you so much for your presence that you said that if we will worship you, that you will inhabit the praises of your people, and we sent you here today. We thank you, Lord God, that we may come in here with sin in our lives, and your presence illuminates that sin within us. But we know because you are a God of grace, we know because you're a God of mercy and compassion, that if we confess our sin, that you're just and you will cleanse our sin and forgive us and wipe away where you don't even remember it anymore. But we also know in your presence we can ask what we will. We can ask for healing. We can ask for provision. We can ask for protection. But we can also ask for the salvation of those we love. And this morning we pray for our lost loved ones, our one. That person that we pray for week after week after week, it may look like they're miles and miles away from you. It may look like it's never going to happen, but you're the God of the impossible because you saved each one of us. And at one time, someone was praying for us, someone who never gave up. And I pray that we will have that determination 
to keep praying until your spirit works inside of them and brings them into a relationship with you. And then not only will we celebrate, but we're guaranteed that all heaven will celebrate with us when the lost are found. And so I call upon the name Aladdin, and as the names are being called out, I pray that wherever they are, your spirit will draw them, will work in them, pulling them closer and closer until they have finally bowed their knee, call you Lord, and receive you as their Savior. And we pray this in Jesus' name, and we ask that you bless this service. Don't let us leave here in the same way in which we entered, for your glory and for your purpose. And the church said, Amen and amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We're going to continue our worship with the giving of tithes and offerings. And since we're in a give series, I'm not going to say much. I'll just invite the ushers to come. But as always, I want to remind you that giving just as much as what we just did in singing and lifting our hands and glorifying all that God is and all that God does Giving is an act of worship. And as we give, we give unto the Lord. We give for his glory and for his purpose. And we will do that now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you because you have blessed us with so many things. Everything we have, you have given. And now we return unto you that thing in which you requested, the 10%. And above that in the offering. And we pray that you will use it for your glory and for your purpose. And that you will receive it from the heart in which it is sent. In Christ's name, amen. so much for your giving and we want to welcome you to our service we also want to welcome those who are watching online uh, we pray that you will uh, in you know hear the word of God and respond that just because you're not with us in physical presence that you can respond wherever you are we also ask that you like share and comment on Facebook in order to spread the gospel message uh, this morning Leandra has an announcement that she would like to make now I want to say while I did encourage her to make this announcement, I did not encourage what is being announced. Uh, and I'm going to leave that at, at that, and I'll talk maybe about that a little bit later. But she wants to say something to you as her church family, and uh, we're just up here to support what she's going to say. wanted to announce today that I feel that God may be calling me into ministry. Um, I felt over the course of my life that he's told me and uh, showed me several things uh, relating to this, but I never saw it as a possible calling until um, this past camp meeting where I responded to an altar call for teens who feel that they are called. Um, and since then, I felt God remind me of this and bring it back to my mind several times through, through uh, my Bible reading and church services and prayers that people have prayed over me. Um, and so I just wanted to take this first, the first step in sharing it with my church family. Um, I don't really know specifically what, he, what ministry he may be calling me into or where. Um, and I had a lot of doubts about sharing this today because I wanted to be absolutely certain that he was calling me. And then a few weeks ago, he brought to my mind a piece of advice that helped us move here, that until we take a step of faith, we'll never be certain. And um, so that's what I wanted to do today, trusting God that he will lead me and guide me in the right direction and in his timing. Thank you. So 
yes, we definitely ask that you <clears throat> keep her and us in prayer, but all of our young people for sure. But, you know, just that, you know, God will uh, continue to direct and she'll continue to have open ears. Um, so I'm up here for the announcements, but I have to get unemotional now. So uh, happy Grandparents Day to all you lovely grandparents. Woohoo! So hold on to your tickets. If you didn't get a ticket, you can raise your hand. Maybe one of the ushers will run and go get you one. Um, Cheryl, you didn't get a ticket? <laughs> Maybe we need to get Cheryl a ticket. Um, but make sure if you're a grandparent that you have one of the red tickets, we'll have a drawing at the end of service um, for that. Uh, four drawings, actually. We were a little generous today. No <laughs> Um, okay, so also another announcement today. The t-shirt or sweatshirt or the long sleeve t-shirts, if you want any of that, please get the order form. Um, if there's not an order form for the one you want, just let me know. I can go bank another copy real quick. I do want to place the orders tomorrow, so please hand them in today if you want something. Um, this Saturday is the men's breakfast. Woohoo! Yes, 8 a.m. at Kincaid Diner, and then you'll all come over here afterwards for devotion, discussion, prayer, whatever they do here. They must do a lot because it seems to go much longer than the ladies' meetings usually. I don't know, but that's that's awesome. I praise God for that and um, for them getting together. I, I really am thankful for that. So, again, that is Saturday at 8 o'clock at Kincaid Diner. Okay, um, several announcements today. Just bear with me. You still listening? Good. All right. So, youth ministry. Youth ministry. Yoo-hoo! So, September 24th, after church, we'll have, they'll be having a, another fundraiser dinner. Um, it will be $10 a person, but you will get chili, hot dog, nachos, dessert, and a drink. You don't choose one of those. You get all of that. <laughs> Uh, for $10. So that's an awesome deal. Um, children five and under are free. So you can sign up. Um, after church, there'll be a few of the young people, hopefully, there with the clipboards and the sign-up sheets, and they have an envelope. If you want to pay today, they can mark that you've paid. Um, or also, you can go to the Church Connect um, through the website. You sign in, and there's a sign up registration there and the option that you can pay online as well and so uh, and that will be designated like when you pay it'll be designated as for youth so um, Jennifer will know which where to put that and then you'll then we'll be notified that you've paid and we can mark it so on that day you don't have to worry about that um, so and, of course, Friendship Day coming up October 1st. Again, invite as many people as you can. And there will be a drawing for the guests and a drawing for um, those who are bringing the guests. And as Vance has mentioned before, those who bring the most guests will have some special prize. If eating at our house is not special, then we'll do something else. Uh, but I think it would be very special. But, you know, that's just me, personally. Not because of my food at all, no. <laughs> but just, just fellowshipping at our house. Um, yes, that was my next thing. He didn't give me time. He didn't give me time. It's right here. Highlighted. Uh, invitation cards. I gave some of you already the invitation cards that we had made. There are some at the welcome desk. I have them in little piles of, like, five or six. Um, or if you think you need more, just you better invite that many people. If you take 10, you better invite 10 people. No. Um, and that's not just for this upcoming Friendship Day. That's just from now on. Whenever you need some of those cards, we've got plenty of them. And it's just maybe an easier way to invite someone um, and that they have that reminder in their hand, you know, uh, once you give it to them. I think it's big enough that they won't lose it, but small enough they can fit it in their pocket. So that's good. Um, so those are available at the welcome desk. Um, I think that is it. Other than now for our memory verse this week. Yes. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. So it's a really short one this week. He's given you a break. So that is a memory verse. And again, the memory verses are also at the welcome desk. The, the new one for each week is in the little container that says memory verse. And then I'll put last week's like just sitting beside it. So usually at the welcome desk, um, there's this week's and last week's memory verse. If you don't have a set at all and you want one, then those are kind of under the television in the uh, for your area. The, each set should be complete. I've tried to keep them up to date, so it should be a complete set there. Um, okay. I was going to say any questions, but that's not, <laughs> not the time for that. Children, are you ready to go to the mine and dig in God's word? Come up here for prayer. You don't have to if you're shy, but still you need to run out the door when the rest of the kids go. Wow, we got extra attendees today. Is that counted as your guests today? You invited them? Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's pray for our kids. Lord, we thank you so much for these children. Thank you for blessing us with them in our church and I pray that you just open their minds and their ears and uh, their eyes to take in from you today and learn from you learn from your word bless um, the teachers and the assistants down there that just fill them with your peace and your strength as they teach today Fill their minds with uh, your word and help them to teach in a way that the kids would understand. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things when it comes to the Friendship Day, and not just that, but inviting people to church, and I've posted this a few times on our Facebook page, statistics show that 86% of people say if a friend or family member invited them to church, they would go. And it kind of puts a lot of emphasis on us having the courage to actually invite them. And just to, uh, I want to encourage you to actually do that. That's really what this Friendship Day is about, that we not only do this once a year, but inviting people to church is something that we do regularly. And, I mean, even if it takes you inviting them to go out to lunch, you know, hey, you you can come to church and then we'll go out to lunch together afterwards. Uh, It could be something that you do that has eternal consequences in the person's life. And so, and then also I want to just, you know, with, with Leandra, uh, I, I encourage her to confess the calling that she has shared with us as a, as, as a family several times since, since camp meeting that she feels that God is calling her into ministry. Because I will say it is something that I didn't really want for my children. Uh, not because I hate the ministry, nothing like that. I just know the pressures that it puts on them. And then I was hoping my kids would be really rich and take care of me when I get old. Uh, <laughs> So still got, you know, Kinder wanted to be president at one time, so no. No, I, I, I just never wanted to be a parent that I pushed my kids into ministry. You see a lot of that in, in, in you know, pastors, missionaries, and other stuff that the kids are kind of pushed into it. Uh, I, I just did not want to ever, ever do that. Uh, so I want to support it because she has made that confession. But at the same time, I'm not going to push her in any, any specific direction. Uh, I will give guidance. I mean, I have trained well over... Uh, probably a couple of thousand ministers in, in, in my ministry. Training my daughter will be unique, uh, but it will be a thing of I do want God to guide her, and I know that he will, and uh, that if it's something that she later says, you know, maybe she was wrong, then I, I'm, that's okay, but to confess it is a step of faith where God will now begin to move her in whatever direction he wants her to go, and uh, I'm... I mean, I'm happy, yet at the same time, as a parent, I'm, I'm worried because I know what it could mean, especially with her life experience, and God could take her anywhere in the world that I'm not, you know, and uh, so do, do 
do pray for us as a family, not only that she will be guided, but that Carrie and I as parents and Kendra as her sister will also be guided in how to help her, yet not push her. And so it's kind of a delicate balance. All right, right, so today we're going to finish our series on giving, and we're going to talk about uh, tithing, and this very specifically of why do we tithe. Now, one thing that, you know, as I listened to the sermon from last week, and I'll tell you, one of the most, if you think I'm painful to listen to, you should listen to yourself. It's really, really painful. And when I listened to myself, I mean, Brent was asking me, do I watch the service? I'm like, no, listening's hard enough. And because uh, I do, I know I have quirks that, that, that Lynette and Ronnie like to point out that I mess with my shirt. And uh, I've been told I mess with my ears a lot when I preach and that kind of stuff. The reason I don't put anything in my pockets is I know if it was there, I would find it and start playing with it. I get that from my dad. Uh, when he used to teach Sunday school. But I, I do want you to understand, as I was listening to it, I, I begin to realize maybe I, I need to be a little bit more clear about some things. Now, when I'm talking about that when we're faithful in the area of tithes and offerings that we will be blessed, I'm not talking about wealth. I'm not talking about riches. I'm certainly not preaching a prosperity gospel. I, blessing is far more involved than uh, finances. Uh, in fact, finances are probably one of the least blessings that God can give us. I mean, for me, knowing that my children are in Christ is a blessing. Uh, I will take that any day. Uh, you know, that are, you know I, by no means am I wealthy or have I ever been wealthy, but God has always taken care of me. It's not that my bank account is full and I, I always have a lot of money and all that. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm that God will take care of us. And he will do things and so, and it also doesn't mean that we can be bad stewards of the other 90%. Because very, very often, you know, if we're tithing and God's blessing us, that we, we still need to be a good steward. I mean, the other 90% technically still belongs to him because he, he owns everything, but we need to be good stewards of it. It doesn't mean, yo, I'm giving my tithe so I can go run up my credit card or those kind of things. That's, we got, we got to be careful not to, not to take the whole concept uh, to an unhealthy understanding. But we're going to talk about this, and, and, and there's a lot of bad teaching and a lot of bad beliefs when it comes to tithes and offering, and we talked about some of those last week, and some of these might be repetitious, but one, that it's an Old Testament concept, but again, as I explained last week, that the Old Testament was not done away with, it was brought to its fullness of meaning, that's what it means to be fulfilled. Also, when it comes to tithing, we can't decide where it goes. The Bible and God has already done that. I mean, many times as a missionary, I would have to turn down people's offerings because they would tell me that it was their tithe, and I would tell them the tithe does not belong to me as a missionary. It belongs to your home home church. Of course, tithe does mean 10%. That's exactly what the word means. It means 10% of our uh, uh, gross income, our total income. It doesn't matter if our spouse agrees or not. Uh, It is something that we're supposed to do. It does not come from the law of Moses. It actually comes from uh, far greater than that. I think it actually originated in the Garden of Eden before sin. But if you want to even exclude that, you can say that it certainly started with Cain and Abel uh, once they were expelled from the Garden. Also, that it must be fruit first. And we talked about that last week, that it can't come after I make sure I can pay my my bills. And that there's a difference between tithes and offerings. Basically, offerings are anything above 10%. And I know some people who say, well, you know, I want to tithe 20%. Well, that's great, but 10% of that technically is an offering because the word means 10%. But why tithe? I think this is something that we don't really talk about in the church enough, is the why. And I have found, as you study scripture, why is really, really important to God. I mean, if you look at the life of the Pharisees, they did a lot of the right things, but Jesus pointed out they did them for the wrong reasons. Very often they were doing them for their own glory, for their own benefit, for how people looked at them. And so the why matters to God. So why do we tithe? And then our motivation in tithing should be based in the truth of Scripture. Now again, as I pointed out last week, uh, I wrote these sermons many years ago. This is not because I'm a pastor. When I wrote them, I did not benefit from the tithe. As a missionary, I did not receive any of the tithe. I only received offerings. That's how we lived off of uh, when we were missionaries. I'm also not doing this again because so the church can pay its bills or have money for outreach or that we can put a roof on, the, you know, to fix the roof and all that. That's not why I'm preaching this. I'm simply doing it 
because it's biblical. And I want to be a pastor in a church who follows the biblical teachings of God, to have a, to have a biblical worldview, to see things biblically. And that doesn't mean by looking in the Bible only, but it means that I see everything through the lens of Scripture. And that is what all, all of our motivation should be as Christians. Uh, and I want to say this, that anyone who tells you that tithing is not biblical is deceiving you and simply or simply does not understand the biblical text. I desire to be a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that as a teacher of the gospel and a preacher of the gospel, that I will have to be held account. I mean, uh, Paul tells us, you know, don't desire to be a teacher. All right? I mean, actually, no, it's James that tells us don't desire to be a teacher. Why? Because you're going to have to give account. And you're going to be held at a higher level of responsibility because you are teaching the people of God. And that I take that very, very seriously. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to hear that more than I want to hear anything else. Well, for Jesus to say that to me, and so I know I have to preach the truth, and I also have to preach the whole truth, that I don't get to select what to and to not preach. And I have to do that. Also, finally, I'm, I'm teaching this and preaching this because I want you and your family and our church to be blessed. And whatever that means for God to bless us, that's what I want. And again, I'm not talking about that we're all rich. I mean, that would be great, but that's not probably going to happen. It doesn't mean that we're never going to have suffering. You can be blessed and suffer at the same time. It doesn't mean necessarily financially, but it does mean that God will care for your needs. It doesn't mean that you won't have responsibility concerning the other 90% because we're called to be good stewards. But what about our motivation of why to tithe? I think, number one, it has to be based in love and appreciation. That we love and appreciate everything that God has done us. If we believe the biblical text, and I was telling the Sunday school class this morning, maybe I'm antiquated, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I actually believe what the Bible says. Not part of it, all of it. I believe what the text says, and the more I study it, the more I research it, the more I, 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 I enrach myself around it, the more I believe it, because I've seen it to be true time and time again. I have never, ever seen it to be false, and when it is preached and studied and read and taught in truth, it has never been false. So I love and appreciate all that God has done, but I also want to be obedient. Now, we don't like that word in our country, but we need to be obedient. God deserves our obedience. And as we've been talking about on Wednesday night, obedience should beget obedience. When Christ offers us grace and this gift that we have, that the obligation of receiving that gift is obedient life of following Him. But also, even though we should do it out of love, even though that we should do it out of thanksgiving, even though we should do it out of obedience, we can also know it's going to benefit us. I guarantee that. And, but that doesn't matter. If Pastor Vance guarantees it, that don't mean squat, all right? God guarantees it. And he guarantees it over and over and over again in his word. Now, again, we're not talking about that you're going to be rich. So if I give my 10%, I'm never going to have struggles again. No. That's, our struggles, if you will actually read the book of James, are a good thing. Uh, something that we should actually, res re re you know, because it brings about our pers perseverance and it brings and strengthens our faith. And that's why often we go through them. But God will bring blessing, not just in our finances, but in every aspect of our life. However, as we're going to read very soon, if you do not tithe, the Bible, not me, don't kill the messenger, says we're cursed if we don't tithe. And we're going to read that in a minute. Those are not my words. Those are God's words. So if you want to just argue that, you can go talk to him. Okay? I mean, I'll, I'll just give you a little insight. You won't win an argument with God. Trust me, I've tried many times. So I'm trying to convince you through this series and through this sermon today that it's part of being a faithful servant and also that I know it will help you. I mean, if we all had cancer, if everyone in this room had cancer and I had the cure... I'd want to give it to you. Well, the Bible provides the cure to many of our problems in our lives, and I'm trying to give you one of those cures. Some of us are living under a curse, 
And I'm trying to give you the key to be free from that curse. I mean, I love you. I wouldn't be in Kincaid. Trust me, there's other places to be. I wouldn't be here if I didn't love the people of this church. It's the only reason that I share these things. Is I've checked my heart, I've checked my motivation. I don't want you to live a life outside of the fullness God has for you. Now, if I didn't love you, I'd just keep my mouth shut. I'd just keep my peace because I know this makes people uncomfortable. I'd allow you to continue living under this curse that the Bible talks about, but I can't do that because I love you. So let's pray our prayer as we enter the Word of God that we pray each week. Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself with your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior. And make the book live to me. For Christ's sake, amen. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Malachi chapter 3. You had to know sooner or later I was going to get to Brother Malachi. Okay. Now if you do use your phone as a Bible, please make sure that you keep it on the Bible. Okay. So, first of all, we'll simply start with Malachi 3 and verse 6. Now, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but you can keep the Bible open to Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Okay? This is the context of how all this begins. Now, context is very, very important when we read and study the Bible. The context is the thing that we can't lose sight of. As we talk about in the Revelation teaching on, on, on Sunday mornings, very often the book of Revelation is so misunderstood because people forget the context of the book itself. And so the, the context of this letter is verse 6. Okay, this is one of the main verses in this text. It says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. Now we've quoted this a lot of times, that God never changes, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? That he doesn't change. And, you know, I'm, I, he always stays the same. And this is what is called the immutability of God. Now, that's just a theological word, immutable, that means does not change. And so when we talk about God being immutable, we mean that he cannot change. Now, you say, wait a minute, now God can do anything. No, he can't. He can't change. Okay? Because if he can change, he's not perfect. And God is perfect. If you're perfect and you change, then you cease being perfect. Okay? You can't, God cannot get better. And he cannot get worse because he's perfect. He cannot love you more. He cannot love you less because his love is perfect. He cannot get less holy or more holy because he's perfect and he never, ever changes. Okay? Let me try to explain it this way. Let's just say the Bible says that God says in the Bible that he is six foot two inches tall. Now, it doesn't say that. Okay? For those of you who don't read the Bible, it doesn't say that. Okay? But let's just say it does. Let's just bear with me for my illustration, all right? If God says I'm six foot two, you say, why six foot two? Because I'm six foot two, all right? <laughs> no. It was a height. I just came up with one. 5'11 didn't sound near as good, okay? <laughs> Someone I know is 5'11, all right? And it's not my wife, Carrie's six foot, even though she says she's 5'11 and three quarters, all right? The Bible says God doesn't change. And let's say that 3,000 years ago, God said, I'm six foot two. How, would, how tall would God be today? He'd be six foot two. Why? Because he doesn't change. But 3,000 years ago, God said, the tithe belongs to me. Does it still belong to him? Or has he changed? God made this has made the statement that he cannot change because it's, it's in relation to who he is, his character, his person. They cannot change. And tithing is one of the statements in connection to his person. It's a statute. Okay? It's not part of the law. It is a statute of God, a standard of God, if you will. And it goes all the way back to at least Cain and Abel, 2,500 years before the law was established. Tithing is an ordinance or a statute of God. And that being defined, it's a principle for ordinary behavior. Okay? Tithing as an ordinance of God is an ordinary behavior that God requires. 
It is why it was before the law. It's why it was during the law and after the law, and it's why it exists today as well, why God does not change. The ordinance God gives do not change. There are degrees made by God, and they can never, ever change. Flipping from the Old Testament to the New Testament does not do away with them. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in detail, but let's, let's read some more in Malachi. Six, we'll start in six again, and this time we'll go to verse 12. Now remember, the context is, is verse six. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord God Almighty. Now again, we must remember that verse 6 and also verse 7 are part of the context of this. The Lord Almighty, the Lord God, was talking in this text. God was talking in this text through the, through the prophet Malachi. These are God's words. Okay. Now they might not be in red in your Bible, but these are the words of Almighty God. To us and to them. He told them, you're stealing from me because you're not giving the tithes and the offerings. But before that, he tells us, I don't change. And then he talks about this. So part of this is part of ungod, God's unchanging na nature, his immutability. So we can't do away with it. There is no way theologically that we can ever justify doing away with this we can't say Old Testament, New Testament, that was for them, not for us, because it is connected to the immutability, the unchanging nature of Almighty God. It is plain as it can possibly be. It cannot be argued. It cannot be disputed. Anyone who ever tells you any other, uh, other thing is denying the very words of God himself. He doesn't change. And he's telling us that we steal from him when we don't tithe, give tithes and offerings. And that when we don't tithe, we're cursed. Now again, he only asks for 10%. Have you ever wondered why? I mean, he's God. He could ask for all of it. Why only 10%? Okay, we'll get to that a little bit later. Man, that, that might keep you alert. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Okay, so the whole thing about it being Old Testament. What was the Bible to the New Testament church? The New Testament church, ironically, didn't have the New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. Their Bible, when John quotes in Revelation, when he's quoting Scripture, he ain't quoting Paul. He ain't quoting the book of Acts. He ain't quoting his gospel. Why? His gospel wasn't written yet. It's the last book in the Bible that was written. John is quoting the Old Testament. When Paul quotes Scripture, he's not quoting Peter. He's not quoting his friend Luke. He's quoting the Old Testament. It was their Bible. The book of Hebrews, for example, in the New Testament. It's a master of Old Testament interpretation, whoever wrote it. We don't really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. and We, can, we know for sure it wasn't Paul, but we don't know who it was. But whoever wrote it was a master of Old Testament interpretation. There are at least 28 Old Testament quotes in the book of Hebrews. What is the main point of the book of Hebrews when you look at it? I mean, when you study the Bible from a book, that's what you should look for first. What's the main point in this text? The main point of the book of Hebrews is that the Old Testament has not been done away with, but that it's been brought to its fullness of meaning through Jesus Christ. It's the point of the book of Hebrews. And again, that's in the New Testament. Many times I tell people, turn to, the book, turn to the Hebrews, and you see them looking in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. 
So why don't we need the temple anymore? Why don't we still do sacrifices? Because Jesus fulfilled them. He brought them to their fullest meaning. Sacrifice wasn't done away with. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. The temple isn't done away with. You want to see it? Look around this room. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It was not done away with. We are the temple. Where does God dwell now? Right here. And like I've said many times, if you want to have a holy experience, go look in your mirror, not at your face, but realizing that Jesus is in your heart. Because some people are not near as cute as they think they are. <laughs> also, there's not one people. Of, I mean, there, there's, not, there, there, there's only one people of God. There's not two people of God. And most importantly, what God said in the Old Testament now is even more important because Christ came. He brought the Old Testament to the fullness of meaning. Everything else was symbolic. Now it has the fullness of meaning. So what God said in the Old Testament is more important now than it was in which the day it was written. The demand for obedience in the New Testament is far greater. You didn't see the prophets in the Old Testament say, take up your cross and follow me. Die to yourself or you're not one of my disciples. You know, we didn't see that in the, in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, faithfulness has been intensified. We're to be followers of Christ, not fans. The warnings in the New Testament are far more severe than they are in the Old Testament. Why? Christ has come. The end is near. I mean, this is all about to be settled. All the things that you see around us that we're so worried about that we sit on the, you know, and sit there and watch the news and, and if you have hair, pull it out or you know, get so frantic about everything. Sooner or later, the king's going to get off his throne and he's going to set things straight. I don't know when it's going to happen. It may happen in my lifetime. It may happen this afternoon, but it's going to happen. Why? Because I believe what the word of God says. And in, he said, it's going to happen when nobody's expecting it to happen. And I think in today's world, I don't even know if the church is still looking for Jesus Christ to come back. So it's a perfect time for him to return, just like he said. But if we want to use the excuse that tithing is an Old Testament practice that should be dismissed, that is really, really, really bad theology. So, four reasons to tithe. And if you, have your, if you, keep, if you take notes, this is number one. And these are really, 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 you know, you're going to have big words, okay? Tithing is a test, okay? That was sarcasm that's often missed by people in my life. I don't know why. Things that I think are so funny, nobody else, except my kids, but they laugh at everything, so. See? Yeah. If you spend time with Leandra and Kendra, you'll think you're the funniest person on the planet, I promise you. But tithing's a test. What's being tested? Our heart. God is testing our heart. What is the most deceptive thing on this planet? The human heart. We lie to ourselves more than we lie to anybody else. And that's a lot. Let's be honest. Our heart lies to us all the time. It lies to us about what our motivations are. It lies to us about what we really need and what we really want. Think about this. Why would we argue with God in the scriptures we just read where he says that he's going to bless us he says if you do this I will bless you tremendously why would we argue that why would we argue its validity why would we even take a chance why would we possibly put that in our I mean who would put it in our head God's not really going to bless you the devil why because that's what he does He's been doing that since the Garden of Eden. God ain't really going to kill you if you, eat that, if you eat that fruit. God didn't really say that. That's his specialty, to bring doubt in our head of what God really said. In, in the text we just read, it says that in different versions, one of the versions says the devourer, that God will rebuke the devourer if we're faithful in our tithes and offerings. How many of us would say, well, I don't really want the devourer, you know, rebuke from my life. I like the devourer. He's a, you know, he's a good devourer. He just eats up everything I have. But Satan said, oh no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. The world's doing that. Your friends are doing that. Maybe your family, maybe your kids are really doing that. But I'm not doing that. 
Testing reveals to us where our heart is. You know, we pray, or you should be praying very often, God, search me. Why? Because we lie to ourselves so much. God, search me. Show me if there's anything in me that's displeasing to you. Anything in me that you don't like, please show me. And let me tell you something. When you pray those kind of prayers, God begins to show you something. You're like, oh, my goodness, I'm more of a wretch than I really thought. He's not doing it to make us feel guilty. He's doing it to bring us to repentance because he loves us. But he's trying to say, he's trying to, the tithe is a test of the heart. And our, our, our memory verse for this week, 621 from Matthew, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then Matthew 15, verse 8, the, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Now Jesus is, 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 has said both of these scriptures. He said, where our treasure is, there will our hearts be, and then our hearts are far from him. So he's saying that our giving, our finances, are far from him. Now, when we come to church, we sing songs. We say we love him. We say that Jesus is the most important thing, but our hearts are where our money is, and often our money is far from him. If we love God, our treasure will be with God. We'll give. It's a natural human expression of love to give. I've quoted this verse many, many times. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. It's not possible. Okay? It's just not possible. It's no wonder that we don't have love for the church because we don't put our treasure there. No wonder we don't have love for God's will, because we don't put our treasure there. No wonder that we don't have love for the world that is lost, who have people who've never heard the gospel, because we don't put our treasure there. Wherever we put our money, the Bible says, God says, Jesus said, that's where our heart is. So the question that you and I have to ask this morning, where's your money? Where's your money? Is it with God, or is it with something, or something else? Let's just be honest. Most of the time, ourself. If we invest our money in a stock, how often do you look at that stock? How often do you spend time in, in, in wondering, how's it doing? You know? If we put our money into God and his church, we're going to take a far greater interest in how things are going. And I don't mean like controlling the pastor or controlling what's going on. I mean we're going to be interested in the things of God when we're investing in the things of God. Again, tithing means a tenth. And it has to be the first that we talked about last week. But all through scripture, the number ten represents testing. Throughout all of scripture. Ten is a number of testing. Okay? I'm going to give you a test this morning. You're, this is a biblical test. I do expect you to answer. If you don't answer, I will call on you individually to quote the memory verses that we have had since we started doing that. I wouldn't do that. Probably. Okay, so let's test your biblical knowledge. So let's see how, how many plagues were in Egypt. Ten. The, the introduction kind of gave away the answer. Okay. He tested the Pharaoh's heart ten times. Okay. How many commandments are there? It's amazing that some of you don't know the answer to that because you're not saying anything. How many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? Ten. How many times were Jacob's wages changed? Ten. How many days of Dan was Daniel tested? Ten. How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? Ten. Again, the, the beginning of this really set it up. Okay? How many days of testing are mentioned in Revelation chapter 2? Ten. How many disciples were there? Yeah, very good. Yeah. I was testing you. Yeah. You knew it was coming. I, I've, kinda, I, I've kind of developed a pattern, haven't I? So, yeah. Eh, sorry. I had to throw that in there. The disciples weren't part of a test. But throughout Scripture, the number 10 represents te testing. So in the tithe, which means a tenth, the tenth is God's test for his people. Every time we get paid, every time we receive income from our labor, God is testing us. Where's your heart? 
Now, he doesn't do this because he needs it. He does it because he knows how much it will control us. He knows that if we are not careful, our heart will go to the other things of this world. And they will come off of him. And so he has consistently given us this test week after week, month after month, to make sure our hearts stay focused on him. He's asking us, do you love me more than things? Do you love me more than your family? Do you love me more than entertainment? Do you love me more than perceived financial security? So let me sum up Malachi chapter 3 that we read. If we tithe, God will bless us. Doesn't mean he'll make us rich, but that he will bless us. If we do not tithe, we're cursed. God said it, not me. Which one do we want? I mean, it's, 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 it's really that simple. What do we want? Now, you don't have to be a very smart person to answer that question. You ain't got to have a doctor to figure that out. Do I want to be blessed or do I want to be cursed by God? Now, if you choose the latter, it doesn't say much for your... I'll stop right there. Okay? But that word cursed, did God really use that word? Yeah, he did. Look it up. We don't like that word, do we? Cursed. I bet you some of you think Christians can't be cursed by God. Really? So God's a liar? Who's he talking to? His people. If we believe that, then this is what we really believe. That we believe just because we are Christians... We can live any way we want to live, do anything we want to do, and never suffer any consequences or judgment from God. There's a word for that. That's called heresy. Don't believe a lie that comes from the devil like that. I mean, it's the same thing with Adam and Eve. Did God really say that? Did he really mean that? Surely he didn't mean that. You're not really going to die. You're not really going to be cursed. He will not really bless you if you give your tithes and offerings. Who are we going to believe? And then people will say, I've heard this said before, but Jesus bore our curse on the cross. Did Jesus bear sickness on the cross? Yes. Ever been sick? Guess it didn't work. Is that what we're going to believe? Did Jesus bear sin on the cross? Yes. You sinned this week? By the way, if you said no, <laughs> you just did. Okay. How can that be? How is it that you can possibly sin when sin, you know, sin was crucified? Did Jesus bear, crosses, or bear curses on the cross? Yes. But when we violate and disobey God's word... He says we're cursed. And some of us are living our lives with that above us because we're robbing him with the tithe and the offering, which he clearly tells us in Scripture, it's not arguable. You can't make that argument. You just can't. Tithing is a test of the heart. Number two, tithing is biblical. Tithing is biblical. Some think that Malachi chapter 3 is the only reference to tithing in the Bible. So I'm going to give you some more. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. 500 years before the law of Moses. Genesis 28 and, 12, 20, 28 and 22. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that you give, him, give me, I will surely give one-tenth to you. 400 years, this was said 400 years before the law of Moses. So 400 and 500 years before the law, our spiritual forefathers were tithing. Why? Because it's a principle, a statute, an ordinance of God. It belongs to him. We don't even give it. We return it. It's an eternal thing. It will never end. Leviticus 27 and 30. All tithes from the land, whether from the, from the seed of the ground or the fruit of the tree, are the Lord's. They are holy to the Lord. 
Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 and 2, When you have come into the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God has given you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord God will choose as a dwelling place for his name. Then verses 13 and 15 in the same chapter. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion from my house. I have given it to the Levites. Those are the, high, the priests. The resident aliens, the orphans. These, these are talking about offerings now. And the ordinance with your entire commandment that you commanded me. I have neither transgressed nor forgotten any of your commandments. I have not eaten of it while in the morning. While in mourning. I have not removed any of it while I was unclean. And I have not offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God, doing just as you commanded me. Look down from your holy inhabitation, from heaven, and bless your people Israel and the ground that you have given us as you swore to our ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. So in these texts, we're even told where to take it, to the place of worship. Well, where is that in the New Testament? The church. We remove it from our house and we bring it to his house. And it's not used for anything else. He says, when I, when I had need of it, I didn't use it. I returned it to God. I didn't use it for my vacation. I didn't use it for my kids' school. I didn't use it for my family. I didn't give it to a TV preacher. I didn't give it to a missionary. I did not pay, use it to pay my bills. I didn't give it to charity. I didn't use it to buy food. I didn't take my wife to dinner with it. I didn't use it for entertainment. I returned it to God because it belongs to God. And he told us exactly where to bring it, that place of worship, which today is the church. It's not ours, so we don't even have a decision of where it goes. It's amazing to me how many of people say, well, I, I decided I want to give my tithe here. It is not our decision to make. And I don't say that because I'm a pastor. I say it because it's plain as day in Scripture. Matthew 23 and 23, if you think it's only Old Testament we're talking about. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin. They even tithe their spices. Please don't put those in the offering plate, all right? And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. He's saying, you guys tithe everything. But you've forgotten justice, mercy, and faith. Why? The heart matters to God. The why that we've talked about earlier matters to God. But he didn't say, oh, you don't have to tithe anymore because this is New Testament. That would have been a perfect time for that. He didn't say you can stop doing that and just if you just do the other really well. He said you are to tithe and do the other together to do it with the right heart. Now, some people try to claim that these you have ought to done refers to justice, mercy, and faith, not tithing. And whoever says that doesn't understand even Greek a little bit because the Greek is crystal, crystal clear. But let's say it is. Let's say he said, just don't neglect the others. Either way, Jesus said to pay tithes in the New Testament. Either way. No matter how we look at it, it's not an argument that we can win. And again, why would we argue it? Why do we search for excuses? If money doesn't control us, if money's not the root of all evil, if money doesn't lead our lives, why do we want to make this debate? Why do we want to have this argument? If we can't see that the devil hates us and wants us to be under a curse where he can devour us, then we're either blind, se severely deceived, or in total bondage. Do you know what Satan's purpose is? Satan was in heaven. He was a beautiful angel, I guess. The Bible talks about that. And then he got a little arrogant. He wanted to become God. Just like that, he was cast from heaven with all his angels. And there's not been a battle going on with heaven since then that he's trying to get back in, that he wants to take the throne. He's beaten. He knows it. Okay, John's very, very clear about this in, in the book of Revelation. You should show up for Bible study every now and then. He's very clear about this. and it, we, We'll get in that in chapter 12. But Satan's purpose is to try to inflict pain 
on God. Satan hates God. He hates everything about God. But he can't do nothing to God. And if you can't hurt the one you hate the most, then you hurt what they care about. And that's me and you. So Satan desires to hurt us, to get us to disobey, to get us to go after our own way, to get us to doubt God, because that way it inflicts any sort of pain on God whatsoever. He's got a holy war against you because you're a Christian. The moment you say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, forgive my sins, you become the devil's arch enemy. And he desires to destroy you. Yet we're told God will protect us when we're faithful. Why would we argue this? Again, this is God that cannot change. Why would we argue? Why would we argue about the windows of heaven? Why would we argue about Satan being rebuked? Why would we choose to stay under a curse? The only reason that we would possibly continue is Satan has won. And he has convinced you God's a liar. It's the only reason. That Satan has convinced you that you can't believe in what God says in his word. Or... You don't love God. And I pray it's not the latter. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 and 8, this King Melchizedek of Salem, remember Hebrews, good book, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham apportioned one-tenth of everything. His name in the first place means king of righteousness. Now don't take this out of context. I might teach Hebrews after Revelation. He's not referring to Jesus here. Next, he is also king of Salem, that is king of peace, without father and mother, and there's all reasons for this, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he he remains a priest forever. See how great he is. Even Abraham the patriarch gave him a tenth of the spoil, and those descendants, descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have commandment in the law to collect tithes from the people, that is, from their kindred to those who have descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not belong to their ancestry, collected tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had received the promise. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by those who are mortal. In the other one, by those from whom it is testified that he lives. Now, what is the whole argument here in, in Hebrews? Basically, that when we, this is something I say almost every week. That when you give to God, when you give in the offering bucket, that little plastic bucket that we have, you give to God. That is what you're doing. That is what's being said to here. That when Abraham gave to Melchizedek, he was giving it to God. That's what the book of Hebrews is telling us. That when we give in the offering, when we give to the church, when we give as unto the Lord, literally... No matter what the person does with it, what the church does with it, whatever, that we're giving it to God. The third thing, tithing is beneficial. And I'm trying to hurry. So we should do it regardless of the benefits because it is an ordinance of God, but it is beneficial. I'm going to give you, a, it's on your notes if you have it, Second Chronicles 31, 4 through 10, but I'm not going to read that because of time. But in this, King Hezekiah realized that he had been disobeying God by not teaching the people to give. And the book of Malachi is about that as well. And that the people had been disobeying God by not giving the tithes as the people of God were commanded to do. But when they started doing it, he came and he saw the abundance from the 10% that was being given. And he felt bad. He was worried. He was like, wait a minute, look at all this. Has, I mean... Are the, are the people okay? He was a good king. He said, are, the, are the people okay? But the priest said, no, king. The people are fine. But because they brought in the tithe, God has blessed them so much. This is just what's left over. Over and over in the scriptures, blessing, not just money, is promised if we're faithful. And then finally, tithing is an expression 
of love. We express our love tangibly to people. We don't just tell them. We do tangible things that back up our words of love. Now let's be honest. If you and I treated people and family like we treat God, probably no one would ever have anything to do with us again. Again, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. A person who says they love something or someone that they don't give to is a hypocrite. Okay? I love Carrie, so I want to give things to Carrie. Not just gifts, but also myself, my service, my life, everything. I remember when we first got married, I mean, when we first started dating, the first gift I gave her to her, this is how I asked her out. I sent her three roses, and I wrote her a poem. Yes, your pastor has a heart occasionally, all right? She was so mesmerized by my poetry that she had to give in, right? A few weeks later, it was Valentine's Day, and her birthday's a week after that. Not a, not, a, not a great time to have a kid around Valentine's Day. Not a girl, anyway. On Valentine's Day, I gave her jewelry. On her birthday, I think I gave you jewelry again, didn't I? And more roses. Then a few weeks later, I gave her a ring and asked her to, to marry me. Why? Because I loved her. That ring, by the way, all of my life, not all my life, a lot of portion of my late teenage years and early 20s, I wanted a certain motorcycle. It was the fastest production bike on the planet at that time. It was the VMAX. I'd been saving really, really hard to get this motorcycle. <laughs> Carrie's wearing that motorcycle on her finger right now. <laughs> but why? Because I loved her more than that motorcycle. You give to what you love. It's tangible. It's an expression. It's natural. It's, it's a part of who we are. Tithing is personal to God. He takes it very seriously. Why? It's expression of our love to him. I'm going to give you an illustration. Now, I had thought about, we were, we're running out of time. I had thought about asking people to come up, but I always hated when pastors did that to me, so I'm not going to do that to anybody. So I'll just point them out. We'll, just, we'll take... The two Ronnies, who else doesn't mind to be embarrassed? Dave. Dave don't get embarrassed very easy. So we'll take Ronnie and Ronnie and Dave. No, this is not about fire, so you don't have to worry, okay? So, okay, Ronnie, Ronnie. I've got to come up with different names for people in this church. <laughs> two Dave Allers, all that kind of stuff. I get so confused. Okay, I'm going to go away for a while, okay? I'm going to take a trip, and while I'm gone... I'm going to give each of you $10,000 a month. Now, this is hypothetical. I'm a pastor, okay? <laughs> right. I'm going to give you each $10,000 a month. But what I want you to do while I'm gone is every month give Carrie $1,000 of what I give you. Every month so that you take care of my wife, my bride, Now, what would happen if I did that, come back a few months later, and I asked Carrie, well, how's the money coming in? And she says, well, Dave, he gives me $1,000 every month. And little Ronnie, he gives me $2,000 every month. I'm like, wow. But big Ronnie, one month he gave $700, one he gave five. This month he didn't give me a penny. Now, Ronnie ties. Don't, 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 I'm not saying that. Okay, This is hypothetical illustration. How do you think I'd feel about that? I mean, she's my bride. She's my wife. I love her more than anything other than God. What do you think I'd do? I bet you I'd cut Ronnie off. Don't you think? I mean, that $10,000 is coming from me. And I was just asking for, a, for 10% of that. I'd stop blessing Ronnie, wouldn't I? I control the blessings. And since I can't trust him, since he's disobeying my wishes, he's, not, he's refusing to take care of my bride, I'm sure there would be consequences. Well, 
2,000 years ago, Jesus told us, I'm going away for a while. And I want you to take care of my bride, the church. And all he asks while he's away, give 10% to take care of my bride. And every time we get paid, we're telling Jesus how much we love him, how much we appreciate what he does for us, and how much we love his bride. What do you think Jesus is going to do when he comes back to those who've disobeyed? Jesus controls everything in our life, whether you agree to it, whether you acknowledge it, and whether you see it or not. Everything we have comes from God. The air you're breathing in this moment comes from him. The food you will eat, if I ever let you out of here, will come from him. Your job, you have a job because of him. Might not be a job you love too much. Might not be one that just pays as well as you like, but he gave it to you. Why tithe? Because it's a test of where our heart is. It's biblical. It's beneficial. And it's expression of love. Please stand. What is God saying to us today? Again, I want to make this very, 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 very clear. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm trying to encourage. If you're not tithing and you think it's because you can't afford it, you really don't understand the downward cycle that you're in. because you're living under a curse according to God you might have a whole lot of things but if you don't have his blessing what does it mean start somewhere test him do you realize that there in Malachi chapter 3 when he says test me it is the only time in scripture that we're told to test God. The only time. And let me just say this. God's never failed the test. But will we? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we come to you. Maybe we are obedient in this area and that we can testify of your blessing. Maybe we're disobedient in this area and we need to repent. I pray, Lord God, that you will help us to see the truth in your word. That you will help us to not be deceived by the devourer who desires to continue devouring our life. Being blessed is not mine to define, it is yours. But I know that I stand before you blessed. I have children who love you. I have a church who seeks you and who loves one another, who are, is a blessing to serve. I don't miss meals. I don't sleep outside. I don't have to worry about clothing or will I be able to make it. Not because of how much money I have in the bank, but because of the God who sits on the throne who takes care of me. I pray, God, that you will move us to trust you. Because that's really what all this boils down to, trusting you. And loving you more than we love anything else. For where our heart is, our treasure is going to be there. Let us test you. Put our treasure and be obedient to the giving of tithes and offerings and watch you, as we sang earlier today, watch you pass that test with flying colors. And I pray that you will open our eyes to what true blessing is. What open our eyes to what it really means. Also help us to be good stewards of the 90% that you allow us to retain. 
Teach us, God, to be good with money. Help us to seek out help and counsel and, and friends and other people who we see are taking care of their 90% that will help them with, that they'll help us with that and give us advice. You have provided people even within the body of Christ that can help us in those areas. Help us not to live above our means, but to be faithful to you and to follow you. Father, if I have preached anything that is untrue, if I have preached anything, Lord God, that offends because of my attitude or my motivations, then I ask for your forgiveness. But if I have preached your truth with the right heart and the right motive, I pray that it will bear fruit in each person's life. This is a scary thing for a lot of people. This is a thing of struggle for many people. Even the most faithful at times of need can, can struggle with whether they should pay the tithe or not. But I pray that you will count us faithful. I pray that your Holy Spirit will nudge us in the right direction. And I pray that we will obey. And I pray that you will bless each family in this church in whatever way that means to you. That you will bless this church so that we can be a blessing to our community. That we can be a blessing to this planet by proclaiming the word of God through, through online services, through preaching, through missionaries, through evangelists, through just going into our workplace. Because we live protected by you, blessed by you, to glorify you and to love you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Let's read the benediction together. May these words of our mouth and this meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And my prayer always for you, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Oh, yeah, somebody's about to get blessed. I forgot about the grandparents thing. Everybody, does anybody, Cheryl, you still need a ticket? You got, all right. Make sure you put that one on the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so we have four prizes, and it's four envelopes with $25 in each envelope. I didn't want to buy, uh, uh, what's it called, gift cards, because I didn't want to tell you where to eat, right? I told Carrie we should buy four gift cards to Cracker Barrel, because only older people like Cracker Barrel, but... Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, you can use this to take your grandkids or your pastor out to lunch. So what do we do? We read the last four or last 749. 749. Nobody 749? Oh, okay. Hey, I can promise you, you can't feed Jim for $25. <laughs> okay, the next one is $740. All right. <laughs> oh, Ronnie thinks he's getting, I know you can't feed Ronnie for, 20, for $25. Bucks. $727. Ah, and you can feed your pastor for $25. <laughs> And finally, 737. Oh. So it took two of them to feed you, Ronnie. <laughs> oh. Anyway, this was something just for fun. This doesn't mean I, I don't want to have, I don't want to rent a gift on Grandparents' Day for a very, very, very long time. Uh, God bless you. Happy Grandparents' Day. Have a wonderful week. Don't forget, Wednesday night, uh, midweek. <laughs>